In this session of View Thunder, I'm mesmerized and a bit intimidated by Alex Garland's 2014 sci-fi masterpiece, Ex Machina. Good to meet you too, Kay. This building isn't a house. It's a research facility. And I want to talk to you about what I'm researching. You are dead center of the greatest scientific event in the history of man. Hello. Hi. Do you have a name? Ava. Do you want to be my friend? Of course. Will it be possible? Why would it not be? Did you know that Nathan brought me here to test you? Kayla, you have to help me. Who is the real test? You. It's strange to eliminate something that hates you. Welcome to View Thunder, curated movie reviews that celebrate art, design, and cinematic storytelling. My name is Kyle, and I thank you for watching. Let's jump right in. Ex Machina is a 2014 film written by and the directorial debut of Alex Garland, who also wrote the awesome 2012 film Dread and directed another sci-fi masterpiece, Annihilation, in 2018. Ex Machina stars Domino Gleason, Oscar Isaac, and a nuanced and beautiful performance by Alicia Vikander. On paper, Ex Machina is a fairly straightforward sci-fi story about a programmer who wins a contest to hang out with his reclusive and brilliant billionaire boss, but then turns into the study of an intelligent android. Of course, things are never what they seem, but like the very best episodes of my favorite TV show, The Twilight Zone, the twist is both a bit frightening and thought-provoking. The film begins with a quick introduction to Caleb, played by Gleason, and from the point of view of his computer and phone, I might add, sitting at work and discovering that he has won an amazing contest. The short scene has no dialogue with nearly all the communication taking place electronically. Caleb is then immediately swooping over massive ice fields and virgin wilderness in a helicopter where he is told by the pilot that they have been flying over his host's estate for two hours already. It's brilliantly compressed storytelling to set out so quickly on Caleb's adventure with the most minimal of setup and show that whatever lies ahead will take place far from civilization. Caleb arrives at the extremely secluded home of his employer, Nathan, played by Isaac, who is the CEO of an incredibly successful search engine called Blue Book. It's here that we're introduced to the gorgeous production design of Nathan's home, which is a mixture of clean lines and simplicity built directly onto the surrounding natural rock formations. The rock flows into the house and interrupts the elegant man-made interior with beautiful organic shapes. To me, it elicits a sense of desire to control nature, which might very well be an underlying theme of this film. It echoes another film with a similar thematic aesthetic, Jurassic Park. The below ground levels of the house offer much less representation of nature and more control with concrete and mirrored surfaces, which brings me to Nathan, this story's own John Hammond. While Caleb starts out as almost a blank slate of a character, Nathan is interesting and a bit intimidating right away. He's introduced out on his deck hitting a heavy bag and working through a hangover. Right away, the differences to Caleb in physicality and personality are striking, so to speak. Caleb is thin, weak, and a bit pasty looking. Exactly the cliche computer programmer look you'd expect. While Nathan, with his shaved head, thick beard, and muscular build, almost seems more visually appropriate as a special operator in a military movie. Even when Nathan is being friendly and jovial, there is an underlying manipulative aggression present to him. At the very outset of their meeting, Nathan is a mixture of contradictions as he tells Caleb that he wants them to hang out as just regular guys, while also constantly setting out his structured expectations. This includes the signing of a very strong non-disclosure agreement. The use of security key cards throughout the house is Nathan's and Caleb's relationship in a nutshell. Caleb is a friend who's absolutely free to go where he pleases, as long as Nathan approves of it, of course. For the sake of creative freedom, Ex Machina was made on a relatively small budget, but it never falls short of its ambitions because the expertly focused narrative builds strong characters and ideas 
rather than huge visual set pieces. There are no massive effects driven action scenes that it can't quite pull off. That being said, the Oscar winning VFX work here is nothing short of astonishing. After signing the NDA, Caleb is informed of the true nature of his visit to test the sentience of an artificial intelligence that Nathan has built. Suddenly, Caleb's prize visit is transformed into a formal study, complete with session numbered chapter cards of an android, created in the form of a young woman named Ava. Now, Ava's introduction into the story is movie magic, and all she does is quietly step into frame, nearly in silhouette, with light showing through portions of her body made up of transparent mesh that highlight her mechanical anatomy. She isn't like the replicants from Blade Runner who can easily pass as human. The VFX work here is flawless and there's no question that what we're seeing is a completely artificial being with only her face, hands, and feet mimicking human flesh. And just like Ridley Scott's 1982 sci-fi classic, Ex Machina asks, what is it that makes someone or something a person? And even if that person is manufactured, do we have the right to enslave them? In addition to the brilliant character design of Ava, I find another aspect of the production design of her room really interesting as well, especially when compared to Caleb's. His room is a concrete bunker lacking much in the way of humanity or even windows to the outside world. Ava's room is far more open with glass walls, a small atrium filled with trees that she can't even access. Like zoo cages, each room gives different impressions of the occupant's freedom while restricting it. With every session, Caleb finds Ava to be more and more remarkable, while also finding reason to believe Nathan is not a very kind steward of this new technology. So Caleb assigns himself as Ava's hero and develops a plan to rescue her. Ex Machina is relentless in posing deep questions while planting seeds of distrust and mounting manipulation of its characters and its audience. But who is really in control here? I watched Ex Machina on a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray released by Lionsgate and A24. It comes in a standard black case packaging with very clean minimalist design on the cover showing Ava and a fairly standard back cover with mostly specs. The case includes both a 4K disc and Blu-ray as well as a digital code. The transfer boasts an incredibly sharp and detailed picture with rich HDR colors, especially in the bright outdoors with the blues and greens and also the red emergency lighting indoors. The HDR grading also enhances the natural lighting streaming into the house upstairs, which contrasts the darker, cavernous lighting below with excellent shadow detail. The audio is very clean and well-balanced with dialogue that is always clear and a really well-mixed score by Ben Salisbury and Jeff Barrow, ramping up the anxiety. Bonus features include some excellent behind-the-scenes featurettes and a Q&A. Overall, it's a fairly standard release as far as special features and packaging design goes, but the transfer on both discs is awesome. I wouldn't go so far as to say this is a definitive release, because if the Criterion Collection or Arrow Video put out a gorgeous collector set of this, I'd be all over it. Now here are some of my favorite aspects of the movie, so consider this section spoiler territory. I mentioned the incredible VFX, but that work would be nothing without Alicia Vikander's brilliant performance as Ava. Her subtle and elegant work is the quintessential special effect here. The surprise here is that Ava is even more cunning and manipulative than the human characters, and therein lies the masterful trick. Without a hint of irony, she preys upon Caleb's and our own arrogance and very human instinct to believe we are the protectors of innocence and femininity. But Caleb is simply a means to end for her. From the moment she meets Caleb, she is studying what kind of a person he is, observing his micro-expressions, testing him with personal questions, and with her reaction to his own queries, assessing his usefulness to her. Vikander is able to transform Ava's body language from unassuming, curious naivete to cool calculation. With such graceful ease, it barely registers at first. There's a pivotal scene during one of the sessions when a power outage occurs, and Ava uses the time away from Nathan's ever-watchful cameras to inform Caleb that Nathan cannot be trusted. The emergency lighting kicks in and surprises Caleb, who looks around the room in confusion while Ava never falters and continues her fixed observation of him. With the most minute changes to her form, the facade of robotic innocence drops and shows a cool intelligence beneath. It makes you question who exactly is in the cage now. It's such an awesome moment. I'm still wondering at what point Ava realized she could trust Caleb to be manipulated. 
Another thing about this same scene that I love is how the camera lingers for just a moment as Ava stands up. Rather than the camera following her up as she stands there is this neat, almost documentary feel to it. It's like the camera operator wasn't expecting her to stand. Her head leaves the frame as the camera follows just behind her movement, and it kind of lingers on her mechanical torso for just a moment. I wonder if it was Garland or director of photography Rob Hardy that made that choice. I can't explain why I like that shot so much, but it's just a neat touch that I appreciate. I really haven't spent much time on Oscar Isaac and Domhnall Gleeson, but they do exceptional work here as Nathan and Caleb respectively. There is a power dynamic established between them early on that changes back and forth as each of them believes they're smarter than the other. My favorite scene between the two of them takes place on the morning Caleb plans to get Nathan so drunk that he can disable the security system and escape with Ava. But to Caleb's surprise, Nathan, who has been passed out drunk every single night, has decided that morning to go on a detox. It's here that we learn that Nathan is aware of Caleb's plan, and then this amazing, quiet exchange happens where Caleb's posture and confidence deflates. And as he stands there, Nathan, in a very quiet and calm tone, lays out exactly how he knows of the attempt to put one over on him. I just love how Isaac delivers his lines here. He's so smug and condescending. <laughs> now, one of the more surprising scenes to me, one that I had actually forgotten about on my most recent screening, is when Caleb kind of slips into madness as he questions his own living flesh and uses a razor blade to slice into himself. It's a rare moment of body horror in the film as Caleb makes the incision and the dark blood flows from his arm into the sink. It made me squirm in my seat. Given what he's seen, it makes sense that he might start questioning his own reality. It was a brilliant move by Garland when earlier he shows Caleb has a pretty big nasty scar on his back and then later gives a backstory of him being in a car accident as a young boy. The placement of the scar is something that can be shown to us, the audience, but it's not something the character can easily refer to and look at regularly, like if it were on his face or arm. So from a storytelling point of view, there's no reason to doubt Caleb is human. We catalog it and forget about it, right up to the point that the character is taking a razor blade to himself. Then there's Nathan's transformation from mysterious egomaniac into sinister villain that challenges our own ideas of what is ethical and morally right. I think it's easy to identify with Caleb, but it's how we perceive Nathan and whether or not we can understand his point of view that can really alter the story. Late in the film, Caleb discovers shocking footage of Nathan's earlier attempts at perfecting AI, and we see that these automatons seem to be fully aware of their imprisonment. The very human trait to desire freedom is present as they scream in anger and bash themselves into pieces against the door. It's shocking because they're not metal-plated robots doing this, but are presented in nude, helpless female form. But any form of creation does involve trial and error. Mistakes will be made. So ethically speaking, when does Nathan cross the line from testing of a machine that he's designed and built to the abuse of a life form. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think it's possible to watch Ex Machina from Nathan's point of view and actually sympathize with him as a, not a cruel villain, but as an engineer trying to perfect his design while also dealing with the existential dread of what he's created. In Jurassic Park, John Hammond never considered the negative ethical aspects of bringing dinosaurs back to life. It took his park's complete failure to break Hammond out of his blinded, childlike enthusiasm. In this story, Nathan is completely aware of what the consequences of AI means for humanity, and he drowns himself in alcohol each night to cope. But his dread has all been theoretical, right up to his own murder at the hands of his own creations, which, of course, he would find unreal. And speaking of Nathan's death, I find it really interesting that when Caleb comes to, after having been knocked unconscious by Nathan, he sees a damaged Ava walk in, but he doesn't ever inquire about Nathan's whereabouts. Isn't he curious why he never shows up? This is where the power dynamic between Ava and Caleb flips and he stays put as he is asked. He patiently watches as Ava gets dressed in the flesh of previous models and admires her new human self. So who is the robot now? Would Caleb have done anything different if he'd seen the bloody aftermath out in the hallway? All the best movies, the ones we truly love and hold on to, give us some new detail or idea or question that adds to the richness of each viewing such as unheard words spoken between characters, a chilling last moment glance as an elevator door closes, upside down shadows moving along a grid, 
Ex Machina is rich in detail, visually dazzling and intellectually challenging. I have so much more I could say, so many more scenes to pick apart, but I'll leave that to you. Hopefully I've given you good reason to discover or rediscover this awesome little sci-fi flick. Either way, I highly recommend it. And that's it for this episode of View Thunder. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed my review, I'd appreciate you hitting those like and subscribe buttons. And until next time, remember to always stay for the end credits.